So welcome everybody to today's In The Know episode, the premium podcast for financial services. Today, I am delighted to be talking to John White, who is the Managing Director of Hurstpoint. So welcome, John. Good to see you today. Right. Um, I've got quite a few topics that I want to go through today, but let's start off quite lightly. And for the people that don't know you, right. could you just give a bit of background information on yourself and your career to date? Yeah, sure. Um, I always hate this question because I have to confess to the fact that this is my 37th year in the uh, wow. <laughs> financial planning sector or wealth wealth management sector overall. So yeah, so it's been a long a long career so far. Oh, um, so well, you're yeah. looking well, John. Thank you. It's treated I you well. Did start as a <laughs> <laughs> rather than a paper round. I did this instead. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, in in a way, that's kind kind of interesting, and in, in that um, I did start. Um, for commercial union in, when I was 19 so I didn't come what everybody would do today coming through a, a degree I did one year of a degree and then then came out and um, my father said well you better go and find yourself a job that comes with some professional qualifications etc and I applied for a, a role called accounts executive for life I hadn't got a clue wow. what it what it would be at the same time as applying for that I was also applying to emigrate to California to be a personal trainer <laughs> Which in those days was quite a rare thing. Yeah. <laughs> this is like mid. You were ahead of the time. Yeah. I was ahead of time yeah. at the, that point, but I'm following, uh, following in Arnie's footsteps. But um, <laughs> anyway, uh, as my wife would say, I made the right decision because I joined Commercial Union and, and I met her there as well. So, uh, so I don't say that actually I made the wrong career move and should have gone off to the sun. But, uh, but yeah. So, but I think the the importance of it is it's I think so many people in in our sector fall into working in financial services it's not a vocation it's not like becoming a doctor or a, or a dentist <laughs> that has to be a vocation mm. um you fall into it but i cannot grumble it's been a fantastic career and uh, has done me and the family really well and i've enjoyed every minute of it so far um so that's kind of how i fell into it um broker consultant for commercial union and npi both insurance companies that no longer exist yeah. Obviously, commercial unions in Aviva, and I was trying to think where NPI is, and I cannot think of it. I think probably Australia Mutual or something like something. that. So somebody will be on there going, it's this, it's that. Yeah. Um, then in the early 90s, became a, a, a an IFA, um, and with, with all my qualifications, got my chartered um, qualifications then as well. In those days, you were chartered through the, the CII directly, uh, as opposed to anything else, but... Um, but yeah, so that's how I so I satisfied my dad in the end of getting the professional qualifications, even though we didn't know what we were going to do. Uh, became a, an IFA, and then basically the careers kind of moved on from there into from being working for small small firms to accountancy practice firms, running financial planning firms of accountancy practices for about twenty years. I make it sound like there was multiples. Technically, it was all one one role, but they got bought and morphed into to different things during that period. Um, the final time we sold to Towery at the time, and then uh, I became a consultant for a little while, doing some work for different people, uh, and then went to Gallagher's to, to run their wealth management side and uh, and to be a chief operating officer, which anybody who knows me knows that that's quite a weird title for me to have, but typical Americans, you have to have a, a C-suite in your title to be on the top one, and that was the only one that was available. <laughs> that's the... Uh, and after Gallagher's went to Sandlam for f four or five years, and then um, two years ago joined Hearst Point. Uh, so I'm a director of Hearst Point. Uh, I'm the MD of Argentis, but no doubt we'll talk about we how will. Hearst Point works and all the rest of it after. But yeah, plenty let's, of time let's not that. take somebody else's job off, 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 <laughs> on your intro. But so, so no, that dude. that's that's my career from from that viewpoint in, in a very brief snapshot. But it's it's gone from definite practicing IFA. Um, planner to to running uh, teams of people to running the businesses to acquiring businesses etc so probably the full gambit in in quite a lot of different scenarios so you've seen a lot and you've seen a lot of changes yeah over the past 37 yeah. years but no regrets no reg well so occasionally <laughs> <laughs> but no regret on the career choice good. Good, good. <laughs> I want to um, I want to jump into um, culture uh -huh. If I can, because I think it's um, it's very topical at the moment in terms of um, when you're attracting staff, when you're retaining staff. Yeah. And I think ultimately, from your perspective as well, when you're trying to perhaps acquire businesses, culture's a, 
is a key thing. But um, in your own sort of way, what does culture mean to you? Yeah, it's really difficult because it is kind of the, the, the trendy thing at the moment, isn't it, to, to talk about culture. Um, and you're right to say, what does it mean to individuals? So there is the standard answer, isn't there? You know, we've we've all got AI capabilities now, and if you do chat GBT, it'll give you a nice kind of yeah. eight different things that culture is, you know, whether it be collaboration, whether it's professional skills, whether it's empowering people, whatever, you know, on, on all the kind of remit list that it, it would give you, all of which are all very valid and are all kind of the kind of regulatory answer that they want to see in in, in, in businesses and, and important to our business and every other business from that viewpoint. But actually, then we're all different at the same time. So, you know, for me, what it, what it, what it, when I think about where have I worked that I've been the happiest where I think I've made the biggest difference from a viewpoint of that cultural piece and everybody being kind of bought into the idea of things, then it has been um, at some, as a producing a financial community. So the community of the advisors, the operations, the team, the management team that you're running, all being bought into what it is that you're trying to do and trying to be. Uh, and you know, that, that collaboration of that team to, to for, that, for the common goal mm -hmm. is absolutely you know vital um and i suppose the number one goal of all that has always got to be if you if you're working in a financial planning business then surely that's got to be you know for the for the goals and aspirations of the client and if that is what you're all aiming to you are going to be in a business that is going to be culturally sound uh is going to be successful and people are going to be happy to work in it that sounds really easy, doesn't it? it, it, it yeah, it doesn't happen say, very often. Yeah. And I think that <laughs> the, the, the next question really that springs to mind is what, how do you go about building that, <clears throat> especially currently in where you are acquiring businesses mm. which will have their own set of beliefs and, and values, etc. So it's almost, is there a playbook to go and build that culture? I don't think anybody's cracked that playbook for that for the, for, for the, the larger. IFA or wealth management, you know, financial services, uh, national type of business, whether they're a consolidator or whatever kind of background they've come, I don't think anybody's cracked it because it is difficult. Uh, it is difficult to, well, let's talk about where it's, n it's not that, it's never easy in any organisation, but it's a lot easier if you are um, a two, three, four, five, five person firm that's come together for common reasons and common goals and, and, and everything is together. You're together every day. You're kind of sharing things every day. As soon as you start to expand into multi-offices, multi-places, more of a national thing, coming from different DNAs of the past, then that's what makes that, that quite difficult. So you do have to go to the chat GBT type answer of culture and try mm. and template it and, and, and produce a, a, a playbook. But And that will get you so far. Yeah. Um, but what you have to try and do is you have to get your immediate management team to be completely aligned on the fact that you're trying to, to, to do it together. So if you can get the 10 people around you sharing your ideals and your goals, and they can then get the 10 people that they look after to share the same goals you know, with, with, with in their own individual way. But it doesn't happen overnight, and so many things change in 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 the current market so quickly that there's mm. quite often not time to embed it um I, th I think also that's why i think the best cultural businesses for if that's a phrase <laughs> that i've ever worked in have been the accountancy practices because they come from a from a dna that's that's been there all the time you know they don't they don't they grow and they they can buy a small practice every now and then or, take, or inherit a small practice. But in the main, they were set up by some founding fathers or founding, founding partners uh, originally. And, and that's built up and that's built up in a, in a DNA fashion. As new people come through and they come through and they come into that training qualification stage and they come through the ranks and then they become, you know, associates and seniors or, you know, and, and associate directors, directors, partners mm. type thing. And so by the time they're getting to those positions and, and um, owning the relationship with the client, they've been in that practice for a long, yeah. long time. It's a heritage. It's a heritage yeah. thing. And that is emulatable in uh, financial planning and uh, in what we do. 
but is is rare and so i would say that really sticks out for me as a as a example of where it's i've seen it the best it's not always that you can still get it wrong yeah. <laughs> you know, I've, I've seen teams where they've not felt that that together in in that kind of background but but it's embedded embedded and it, and it grows and it's and it's there it's almost yeah. it's a tangible that yeah. you can see in your management team meetings how prevalent is the discussion around culture because we live in a numbers world yeah so yeah. how do you balance the, the culture with driving performance and driving those behaviors yeah. to ensure that performance comes <laughs> through it must be quite difficult yeah no it is it is difficult um you interviewing one of my team in the next couple of weeks. So I can... <laughs> that way you just said was absolute rubbish. <laughs> He's never done that in his life. I'm always for hire, John. You know that. Um, yeah, no, it, it is difficult, and you kind of have to split out the meetings because if you, I don't know, if you if you're in a if you're in a board meeting, and you've got your shareholder there. It's you know there'll be some reference to you know how does the team feel how's the mm -hmm. the energy you know what's you know what's our clients feel about this and things like that but but you're right in the main the main focus will be about the commercials yeah um and so you you have to do it in the different kind of meetings that you have and the and the sub meetings so so those the best conversations happen amongst the management team uh, uh that are client facing or doing the operation and the servicing uh when um they're not about the P&L uh, okay, uh, you, I, have to, I, you have to make the time. You, you, know, you can't avoid the P and L conversations. They're always going to be there, depending on you know. It's uh, a fact of life. It's a fact of life. Yeah. But you have to make time for the conversations that are are client focused. And it, you know, people will say, "Oh, we will. We have a client focused group, or we have um, client committees now." You know, and there's obviously a major change towards how people deal with these things, particularly following consumer duty. Mm. Um, but they need to be genuine, you know. They don't. They need to not just be there to tick a box from what they think the regulators asked them for, because they will have much better businesses and enjoy their roles much better yeah. if they are genuinely talking about the things that will make a difference. I'll, I'll come on to clients later on, and, yeah, yeah. and, and that sort of um, <clears throat> the way that the industry has changed itself um, over the last few years. Um, but the question, I guess, I'm going to ask you now is about leadership. Then, so if you're saying that. The way that you've done it is to get those people around the table, to get them to believe, you know, in you and what you stand for and what you're trying to do. So, in your experience and from what you know, what what makes a good leader? <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, so, just for that, I, I, that's what I was trying to do. Jane. Have I been successful every time? No. Okay, uh, and I suppose my. Um, my cheeky answer on what makes a good leader is if you looked at my career, looked at everything that I've done wrong through the years, and you didn't make those mistakes, you'd probably have a successful leader. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, I get that. Yeah. But, and, and there's a serious point behind that, that you learn more from your mistakes. I genuinely, I know it's an old adage and people always say it, but it's I true, genuinely though. think you do you learn do. For, for when you get it wrong. Um, and as long as you correct it, then, then you do. Um, so I have genuinely learnt more from uh, people who um who, who when they've got it wrong mm. <laughs> and, and watched that and thought oh, I, I mustn't make that mistake yeah. uh than um than right but yeah I mean, good good leaders are people who um can inspire you to make the right decision uh, to to in what their aim is their goal is to to what they're trying to grow and if you can buy into that and it's something that you think is also a good thing and you want to be part of then you will work for that person and you'll do you know the extra the extra mile or whatever phrase you want to use uh, to 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 achieve that with them would you um, would you say you are a leader would you classify uh, yourself as a leader because you mentioned earlier on about having a job title in the US and the people that know you probably wouldn't have thought of you in that job title so would you say that you can see yourself as a leader yeah absolutely um yeah I, I would. The job title was more the operations part of it yeah. than the, the chief part of it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the detail. Bit, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So, so <laughs> vision's you know, good. I could yeah. still inspire. I'd like to think uh, yeah. an operation team to actually do the right thing. But could could I go in there and do their job for a day? Probably it's not. not gonna <laughs> so, uh, so that's the difference. I, I, absolutely, I would describe myself uh, as as a leader. I think you know, I think people 
in the main, you know, there'll be loads of people on this going, oh, I didn't like him. <laughs> but, but, You'll get the but, comments. But I, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think there's more that do or yeah. would, would would say that they enjoyed their time. But you can't please being, everyone. Being, can you? Hear? And I think that's the other important part is, you, you know, a leader's got to be um, content that they are going to make decisions that somebody's not going to like. But can you hold your head up and say, I've explained why that decision has been made or I believed in that decision for the right reasons and it wasn't for selfish reasons, it was for the good of the team, the business that you're trying to lead. That's really important and it's really important to me. That's the, the integrity of a leader mm. uh, from that viewpoint that they haven't just selfishly gone and done what they wanted to do for their own benefit. It was yeah. done for the benefit of the business yeah. uh, and, the, and the clients of that business and that doesn't always happen. Uh, so that to me would be a kind of key aspect of, of what a leader should be and be about. And what would you say has been your biggest challenge then? So 37 years. All right, let's not home too much on that. We can edit that bit out of the way. <laughs> so you, you've been in the, the industry a while. Yeah. So what would you say has been the biggest challenge, which is that it's really pushed you? Uh, right, okay. Um, <laughs> there, there have been a, a number um, and they they differ. Um, you, so they they could be that you're joining a business that um, isn't financially sound at that point, or you you know I've I've worked in a couple of businesses where I've been brought in to uh, to deal with regulatory issues. Um, so they, they they could be, you know, the the old adage of being in the in the the rooms in when they were in Canary Wharf, the the regulator and you get put into the room with no windows, a bit like this studio, actually, <laughs> um, which is a, which is a, an old adage of not 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 being in a great place. But um, so the challenge of fixing businesses, whether it's fixing it because its advice structure is not quite right, or because um, it's financially not not kind of doing what it should be doing, or the the cultural piece is wrong and things like that. They are all challenges and all quite demanding and all take time. So, you know, mm. if you're going on the challenges of regulatory bits, you know, I'd say that actually from start to finish of, of one particular role um, to, to start that, it was 18 months, you know, and it was a retraining of advisors. It was a redoing of processes. It was bringing in consultants. It was uh, getting the, the board on board with the fact of the changes and the investment that was going to have to be made. It was keeping the, the regulator up to date with the changes you're going to make. All of those are massively um, big challenges and, and stressful situations. Uh, but actually, out of the back of that, the best team I ever had working for me uh, and the best people, and they've all gone on to, to be really successful in, in other areas on what they do, was that team that I had at that point. And I will be forever grateful for uh, for those people, um, for that. Uh, That's for those, interesting. For those so the moments. biggest challenge was well, that is the biggest thing that it was the high, it was the, the the most high stressful bit from that viewpoint. I mean, I, I would say, at the same time, actually, the worst job you could ever give me is a job where the business is actually tickety boo, running along quite smoothly, uh, it's making money, uh, doesn't really need anything. I'd find that really stressful because <laughs> I go, what do I do with this? <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to sit here just kind of making it, you know, tick along. Um, so actually, I I enjoy um, challenging situations. I could have done without that regulatory one in a way, but you know, but the, the idea of rooms, yeah, 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 but the but the idea of of or the satisfaction of having turned it round and actually got it to a point and, and you know, and, and later day it was it was sold on uh, to to another another business, uh, you know, uh, in, in 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 great shape. So you know that they are moments to be proud of uh, at the end so that they make a big difference um but yeah from a I, I just would hate the kind of run of the mill what we you know just let's run this yeah. business and I couldn't do that so wh where do you think that motivation comes from then so the, the challenge of that business that you mentioned yeah why do you think you need those challenges why does that make you sort of motivated and make makes you who you are i guess yeah I'd, I've, I've never been very good at just plodding along and and just uh i, I like a challenge you know i, I like yeah uh, I, I, almost to the point where i go why have i done that mm. <laughs> um it's just in my dna i suppose I, don't, I i i can't really answer that one james to be honest it's just part of we're all kind of different aren't we and we all kind of you know i i, I could get 
bored very quickly. <laughs> so, like, and I, yeah, I understand that, and I, and I think I've spoken to a number of people where, you know, high performing people, stressful jobs, etc., and it has come at a sacrifice. Is there instances in your life that you look back on and think, ah? maybe work was too much of a priority back then, maybe I was too focused, or did you manage to get that balance right between your professional life mm. and your personal life? Um, oh, God, it's like confession time. It is, it's, yeah. it's, isn't it? Let's get emotional now, John. Let's go. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm not really good at emotion, but anyway. <laughs> um, no, I didn't get it right, I'm afraid. Um, I, I, look, I, I, didn't, I didn't get it horribly wrong. I am thirty. I'm on my thirty fifth year of marriage, so I definitely haven't got it wrong. Um, we still talk <laughs> <laughs> on text. We still yeah, we still sit on the settee together, same settee, <laughs> not the same settee, but the, set, the on this. Yeah, yeah, I can we've imagine had new yeah. settees through the years. But yeah, yeah. Um, you know, we've brought up two great kids, all the rest of it. So, so I've got a lot of things right. But you know, old farts like me now talk about oh you know it's, you know don't these are the important years with your children and you know they grow up so fast and all the rest of it and i remember getting told this at the time and you go yeah yeah and, you know that, that six month old will never stop crying and i've got this for the rest of my life and i'm never going to sleep again and then suddenly they're 29 and 32 <laughs> you go oops what happened there yeah. uh, so it does it does go very very quick and no at the time where i was the most uh ambitious career-wise was right at the time where you miss those you go oh yeah maybe i should have been around for there and you know why why was karen really angry with me because i missed that um parents evening or didn't share my load on that bit or you know mm -hmm. didn't didn't make it home on time for for dinner on that but you, you will all do it uh you know mm -hmm. uh, anybody in a in, anybody in a role that's client facing as well is is always going to have that 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 uh, that push pull. I do I do think the new the, the you know the, the current generation of people coming through are you know are more savvy to this, uh, and maybe without realizing it, that's what the work life balance is really about. It's about learning from from my generations of where we we weren't great, as we learned from we our did, previous we generations did. who were really really bad at it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we're all getting better at these things through the years, but we have to learn from people doing it wrong. Yeah, yeah it's progression. But, but the short answer to your question is no, I didn't get it right, mate. No, no. <laughs> I don't think we all do. John, <laughs> no, I, I didn't. Okay. It's a litany of disasters, I have but, to say. Fortunately, I came from a very forgiving family, <laughs> and I have a very forgiving wife. But you know, I, I talked to my son about it, and I mean, my dad was never around because he was always working, mm. and I feel that I was around a lot more for him yeah. going to all of his Christmas plays, which I detested anyway because yeah. I just think the production value is so poor, and it's a story that you've heard a thousand times. Yeah. And he, he never had a, a star in part either. But he, I don't think, uh, I like to think I was around for the, the times when they needed me. Yeah. And that was the important times. And in the future, I will be. Yeah. But, you know, I am quite selfish in terms of building a business because it's what motivates. Yeah. So I, I, I do get it. Okay. Well, just talking about um, before we finish your career. Um, Are we still on question one? No. <laughs> It's a multi-layered approach. <laughs> By the way, isn't this Joe Rogan? When's the whiskey and the cannabis coming out? I was just, I was in a minute, we'll get Edward in. <laughs> okay. He'll do it in a second. Yeah, that'd be great, though, wouldn't it? Um, just on this, so who who is who has been your biggest inspiration in your career? <laughs> um, do you know I'd love to give you a great answer for this, and I don't have one. Um, I, I can't tell you one person. I just mean that nobody's inspired me. I mean, there isn't one individual that, that that's inspired me for 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 everything. And I and I kind of feel a, a little bit like so I'm not giving the game away, but you you shared some of the questions uh, with me, so I got an idea about what you might say. But um, and th this was on there, and I was really trying to rack my brain. And uh, and it kind of it differs, I suppose, depending on what it is we're talking about. So, you know, when I go go back to before I came into the career and was thinking about going off and be, going to ca uh, California, then, you know, I, as a as a kid, all I, all, I, all I did was weight training and things like that and, and some rugby and stuff like that. But, you know, so Arnold Schwarzenegger was, was, was a hero at that point. He was the man. Uh, he was the man. Like, let's not look at the man today, but, you know, <laughs> the man then was quite, quite inspirational when you didn't know what drugs he was taking and things like that. But anyway, <laughs> um, <laughs> allegedly. 
Uh, no, yeah, <laughs> no, he's, he's admitted. He's yeah. admitted it. Yeah. Okay. Um, but yeah, so so from that, but and then you you go through your career, don't you? And you 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 have moments in time where you know starting starting as a broker consultant. I remember looking at some of the guys who had been doing the job for years and the kind of nice lifestyle that they had at the time of because they were they were established and what they were doing and you you, you know how um how they pitched things in a sale and things like that so that they would inspire you at that moment and then you you move on and then you've got you're working with managing partners of accountancy practices or or uh, or ceos and um they either inspire you because they've done something and you think actually yeah that's really good i like the way they've positioned that or the the way they've got me really wanting to work for them or you go how the hell did you get that job or am i mm. making that mistake um, they're all inspirations <laughs> in a very bizarre, different way. Yeah, in an um, opposite way. Yeah. So, yeah, they, they, um, yeah, they, 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 they would be. So there isn't kind of one, one, one person or, or, or one thing from that viewpoint or a business brain or, or there's not the magic book that I read or, or anything else like that. Like I said, I completely fell into the uh, profession. Are you? more of a pragmatist than you are like an emotional person do you tend to keep things pretty much on a yeah on an even completely keel? stoic yeah <laughs> <laughs> keep nothing away yeah it's not yeah i mean i, I think people have accused me of that before of giving nothing away it's not a it's not a conscious shield uh it, it, to 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 not give anything away it's just um yeah, I just it, it's just i'm, I'm quite fortunate in, in a way because it, it keeps me calm keeps me means that i don't get Stre- you know, I don't kind of show show stress from that viewpoint. It's a pain for the family again because they never see me <laughs> too much emotion. Or anything to know whether I'm <laughs> can you remind me every now and then? Do you love me or don't you love me? Kind of, thing. of course, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, I'm pr- I'm pretty I'm consciously stoic on, on things because there are things that you can change and there are things that you can't change. So what's the point of worrying about the things I can't change? Like I'm just going to focus on the things that are under my remit to, to be able to do something about. And that's actually quite liberating, I mm-hmm. find. Mm-hmm. Um, but I we're all made of different genetics, aren't we? And so I've had many a conversation with people who are far more emotional, far more kind of wear the heart on the sleeve, far more affected by things. And... Um, you must have worked with some really theatrical yeah, type yeah, people yeah, who yeah. literally lose their temper at any given moment. Yeah, yeah. Let's not name names. I've got to say, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I was planning that, okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and, and in sometimes they would do it for effect and you can sell those. Uh, and I get that occasionally. It's quite nice to, you know, even I'll do it occasionally. You know, if I want to, if I want to demonstrate to somebody that I'm really not very happy, then you know, there might be a, a, a heightened voice or a a few more swear words than I would normally use or whatever else mm. so you might do it for effect but but others like you say are just emotionally charged that way and yeah, 100%. um percent it's you know I've I've done some coaching and mentoring for people and uh that's very hard to 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 coach out of them I think you you actually end up coaching more how they deal with it and um yeah uh, yeah and how, how they just fit it into their armory but I feel quite fortunate that I don't have that in me because it's 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 a very conscious tick isn't it if you lose your temper very quickly and that you the, the other person is completely mm-hmm. got the upper hand then because they know exactly how, what they've done to you and where they've got you yeah i think there's a time to show emotion and to you know if you're not happy and yeah but i've also i've worked with very theatrical people yeah. um and i think you just expend a lot of energy mm. and it's like well what are you doing and i think being part of a leader it is again going back to that vision working through your problems and not yeah. showing too much emotion because it can it can drive a negative effect upon yeah. the team and that then drives down to everybody yeah. else in the business but i do think you need to have that edge yeah would you agree i, I do i do agree um the downside of being um like me is that sometimes that you will get accused of not caring you know whether it's home whether it's work whether it's you know uh, uh, an important situation so it's only over time that people realize that but do you, you process care. that comment when people say uh, i used to used to process it quite a lot and now i know i do care and i'll just prove it by the actions that i'll have taken to 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 fix any situation so or try and prove it can't always fix it but yeah okay um well let's let's move on to now then so we've right. got a bit of background history and career <coughs> um so today you're at hearst point yes um I'd like to know more about Hearst Point. 
the first question is, how do we, um, what do we call Hearst Point? Do you like to be called a consolidator and a, quite a growth business? What, what's the best way to describe Hearst Point? Yeah, no, um, I, you know, it, it doesn't shy away from the phrase consolidator. It's yeah. not a dirty word to it. Yeah. Um, so it's so a Hearst Point was a vehicle set up uh, in 2019. Uh, it's the brainchild of a, a guy called Ian Gladman. Uh, Ian's uh, come from a, a private banking type background, but was also at Quilter during the the time that they were doing their restructures, etc. So he's 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 been in the the financial services sector for for, for quite a while. Um, he thought, as did a lot of other uh, investors at the time, uh, thought that there was a, an opportunity to 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 you know grow a wealth management business. He um, so he set up a business called Hearst Point, so named I believe after a, the lighthouse that's down near Limington, I think, and down that, down on there. So that's kind okay. of where the t- the name comes from. But it, it is just the vehicle. Um, it doesn't trade as such, um, so it can cause confusion from a viewpoint. Am I Hearst Point? Am I a dentist? Where does Hawks more fit in? But um, so Hearst Point is just the vehicle, and uh, with a uh, private equity house behind it is uh, is currently Carlisle Group. Um, so um, so so that's the vehicle for for acquiring. It acquired its first business in twenty twenty. Which, if everybody thinks about the timing of all this, is is right in the middle COVID. of uh, COVID. Mm. Yeah, so so it's so quite a challenge to kind of get all this set up. The first business it bought was Harwood Group. Uh, Harwood was a, a listed business, uh, although uh, quite a small listing, and uh, down on the south coast, predominantly the uh, IFA business, with a with a few trade names in its stable as well, just to create even more confusion about who we are and what we are. Uh, then then they acquired uh, Hawksmoor. Not the steakhouse, but the investment management <laughs> firm. Um, but that then basically gave it the two divisions. So it gave it the financial planning and the investment management side. And we still trade today in those two divisions. Okay. So Hearst Point doesn't trade, just, yeah. just the, the name at the top. And the two trading entities are Argentis and, and Hawksmoor. I am the MD of uh, Argentis side. And Sarah Soar is the uh, MD of the um, investment management side of Hawksmoor. What's it like working for a firm which is ultimately backed by PE? Because you've worked with accountancy firms, you've worked with national advisory businesses. What would you say are the differences working with a PE firm? <laughs> right. This is still my job. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so come ask me in a few years' time. Yeah. Um, no, no, I'll, I'll check it. So it, it you, you are right, and I think I intimated at the start. It, you know, I've worked in some very different environments. You know, twenty years in accountancy type of environments, um, American-owned uh, insurance broking consolidator in Gallagher's, mm-hmm. um, uh, South African-owned insurers. So not just different types of entities, different countries as well from from that viewpoint. So, so what's it like working for an American PE house? Uh, when I was a financial planner. I used to describe some clients, and I'm sure everybody who who uh, advises on clients will re- this will resonate with, is they had three three main goals. That was they wanted their assets completely guaranteed, they wanted maximum growth and maximum income. <laughs> okay. Right. Yeah. So impossible. Yeah. In, in its very nature. Yeah. And PE is a bit like this, is a bit the same, but for the, for the commercials of a business. It wants maximum revenue. It wants maximum assets, maximum clients. Yeah. Uh, so you might have um, eight optics that you're being measured for, and you know, and they're super bright, and the super bright people there that 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 knows the numbers, knows the 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 numbers behind it all, and uh, you might be right on seven and down on one. <laughs> That's Guess it. what the meeting's going to be about? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you're going to focus on that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it is. It is, and, and and that one of the reasons I wanted to to come into it was because it was the one area I hadn't worked in before, and um, so I was intrigued. I also thought I was old enough and wise enough to try <laughs> try try and do it, which I know I've joked with few few people about. Um, and it it is different for for that reason. So it's really switched on. It's very very clever people. Um, but you know, it's not their job to understand financial planning it's their job to understand how you buy businesses and sell businesses and make money off the back of that and and how you make sure it's it's on the right trajectory and so they need people like me and and my teams who understand financial planning to to run financial planning businesses and they are very client focused the clients are their investors Um, so we kind of learn how to be more client focused from how they are with their clients 
uh, as well. Okay. So, yeah, because they, so, you know, everything is about the investor and the optic of that, which is quite an interesting dyna- dynamic that pr- probably people don't think of because they'll say, oh, yeah, private equity is not client focused. Well, well, it is. Mm-hmm. It's very, very client focused, but it's the client, it's the client of the private equity yeah. that their main focus is. But as the management team behind that, we can learn. Yeah. Um, so you've so actually been able to learn from <coughs> from the PE guys in terms of how they treat yes, their ultimate absolutely. Client. Okay. Yeah. And and Carlo being very good from a viewpoint of, you know, it's a it's a massive institutional uh, private equity house, so it's got a lot of uh, resource behind it and a lot of areas that that you can really plug into, and it invests in a lot of different vis- businesses that again you can have access to to understanding how they've they've done things, but. Um, you know, it is what it is. It's a, it's, it's there for a reason, and it's driven by that reason, and uh, and that's 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 what you are going to be working in and, and challenged in as a, as part of that management team. Um, yeah, and, and that. So 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 it's it is different from the others, but yeah. uh, in all of these, the interesting bit is, um, you know, since not since I worked for a small IFA in the mid nineties. Have I worked for a financial or in a financial planning business that was purely just a financial planning business? So it's always been an accountancy practice yeah. or an insurer or a, a consolidator in a private equity or, mm-hmm. and so the commonality between all those is that you're owned by people who don't necessarily understand financial planning. Yeah. So my job at a senior level is to set the expectations and be that that um, checker of what somebody might be asking you to do at the, the, the owner level to what is, is that practical, is that possible, is that something an advisor can do, is that acceptable to the regulator, is that something a client's going to benefit from, and then throwing it back if it's not. Mm. And uh, in a way, I think that's quite interesting because that's the senior management uh, responsibility piece now. That that's that's that at my level is what that's about. It, you should never take on an SMCR level if you are not happy to challenge back to your 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 owner mm-hmm. uh, that you think there's going to be a wrong decision or whatever, and that can come in any of these businesses. And has consumer duty made that happen more so now in terms of what the outcomes, what the regulator may or may not be looking for? Uh, not so far, no. Um, I wouldn't say so. Um, I, I'm not. I, I'm quite positive about consumer duty, uh, just for the record. Um, <laughs> not, 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 not because I think a regulator might be on, on the call. <laughs> <They'll be laughs> I genuinely, yeah. Be you know, I think I think there's been two pieces of um, legislation, regulation, whatever you want to call it, in my lifetime that have made a material difference positively to financial planning and and the commerciality of of of, of it being sound to be a financial planner rdr was one mm-hmm. uh, and i think a lot of firms are still in existence today and firms that have, have, have were were successful when they were in existence and are probably now swallowed into other firms um they learned they they dealt with rdr pre rdr and had and made the switches made the changes to more fee orientated businesses in that way. i think in consumer duty world People are still on playing catch up of the opportunity that consumer duty gives to them to be to make themselves more commercially viable. Yeah, and so I think that's the only difference. But I think they are the only two pieces of legislation that I can point to that that really benefit our profession. Okay, uh, so I've, I've, I've kind of answered a different yeah, question yeah, to no. what you asked there, James. Yeah. But go on. That's fine, no. <laughs> I'm going to go back to consolidation because I think it's still in the press. There's yep. lots of um, every week there seems to be uh, a firm that has been sold acquired etc um what's the consolidation market like at the moment probably compared to 2020 um okay um so i'm trying to think of when the first i think i think there's been a, a real march on consolidation with the private equity houses that have come in over the last what four or five years uh, in the main um, you know, everybody talks about there's 36, 37, 35, whatever, whatever it is. You know, there are a lot of uh, investors uh, in there thinking that they can actually, um, you know, make make good money for their for their investors uh, in in wealth management. And 
a lot of that is predicated on what happened in the American market, um, where the multiples did you know, grow, and, and, and basically it was as simple as you uh, acquire at one rate, make yourself of a certain scale, the scale then gives you the ability to sell at another rate. I know it's not giving away any secrets, anybody can kind of see that, but, you know, what goes on in the market. To, so to some extent, it didn't, you didn't even have to fix the, or, or bring it together, so you have consolidators, and then you have integrators. Don't you? Mm-hmm. We are definitely an integrator from the fact that we actually bring the businesses together and make it as one, and then you have that kind of um, just people who keep them the same and own them but don't actually do anything with them and just keep them trading separately. So, as it, um, but but you so think that's, that's where it was. But do you think it's more realistic now? Because I, I read uh, in the I th- paper about succession. This is being, oh, being quoted. Here we go. All right. All right. And if, if Aviva's listening and they want to buy a search firm. <laughs> Remember, I started a commercial union. This is my fa- this, this, this <laughs> is the institution that brought <laughs> me into the business, this into is, the industry. <laughs> well, when, when, I, when I read the report and after write downs, it was something like a multiple of 56 times <laughs> EBITDA. Right, right, right. I mean, that's the headline news. But right. in, in real terms, you know, it, is is it more realistic? Has has the market sort of calmed down a little bit over the right. last sort of 12, 18 months? The, we're definitely on a pause. Um, we're de- you know the the market is definitely on a pause at this minute in time, driven by interest rates, driven by uh, you know downturn on valuations, profitability of businesses isn't the same as it was two years ago at the moment. Um, access to capital is is, is lower. Uh, across across the, the those businesses, and um, there is a level of digestion going on, of businesses that have been acquired needing to be digested, and the investors saying, uh, "Can you prove to me that what you've bought was a good investment, and why, why did we do that, or why have we invested in that, and and you know, can you get your your EBITDA or whatever their measurements might be um, to to show that positivity before we go again?" So there there is an element of that. There is also an element of um, it's becoming more and more obvious in the UK that the the only way the consolidator will will work is scale. It needs to be big, yeah. And so there is that 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 case of you know it's a bit like the platform conversations in the past, although they've not really sorted themselves out because it seems to be still more and more platforms. But it's a whole different it's a whole different podcast um but you know there, there doesn't need to be 36 and there cannot be financially uh, viable 36 different consolidators because some of them are tiny there are there are regional ifa firms that are bigger than some of the consolidators yeah. um so they need to, to to grow in scale so so they almost need to kind of cannibalize each other in some ways you know, which is a terrible phrase but it's gonna happen, though. yeah yeah um so i think that will be a a a focus and so that but you can see in the market at the moment, there's the expectation of a seller is here. What the buyer's willing to now pay or look at paying is here. If you find a buyer that's still willing to pay the seller's expectation, be wary because I don't think that buyer's going to be around for very long. <laughs> okay. Because, because either because they're doing it because they're paying a premium because they think they can get out in their next move. Uh, or because they're not very bright at understanding what the valuation should be to make money. So on that point, what advice would you give to um, an advice business which is starting to have those conversations about looking to be sold? What, Because it's, um, I don't think these acquisitions are easy and there's a lot of emotion as well. And yeah. you are dealing with entrepreneurs you know, yeah, mainly and, and business owners. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and I think it's their, it's their baby and they've taken the risk. So. What advice would you give to those people who are just starting that journey of thinking about exit? Yeah, okay. This could be a long bit now. <laughs> um, so the, fir- the first bit to the owner or the owners is really ask yourself why. What, why are you doing it? And, 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 and I don't mean why as in don't do it. I just mean what is your driver? Is it because you've got people underneath you that want to succeed you and want to kind of go for it, but they can't afford to, so you you know you need money out? Is it because you've had enough in the industry and you're genuinely getting out? Is it because the pound signs are just showing at you and you just find that irresistible to do it and you believe that you could have take your money off the table and then continue in the business thereafter and everything will be great? You know, what is the true reason for why you're doing it? Yeah. 
don't try and do it without having a pr- uh, a proper corporate uh, f- whether corporate financier, corporate advisor, whatever you want to call them, behind you uh, to to really give you some good guidance on on what um, on that why and what's going to drive the best uh, the best type of buyer for you because uh, it isn't all just about the money. I would say that nine times out of ten. If you go into a, a getting a whole list of people who will offer you a, a rate for your for your for your business, the one that offers you the most wouldn't be the one that would have given you the most at the end of the process. Mm-hmm. Okay. Always be wary of the highest deal, um, because they tend to chip you at a, at a, at a later point. Um. And but we're back to that word that we said at the point of what does it really mean and what is it? It's the cultural piece. You know, I would say that the deals we've been doing in um, in in Hurst Point, Argentis and Hawksmoor, none of those deals are quick. They all, you know, can take twelve months, uh, which always kind of amazes um, sellers. You know, mm. oh, no, no, surely you know, if you've agreed a price, that'll be it, kind of thing. And a lot of the proportion of what's going on in that twelve months is cultural. Is this a business that we're buying that the people in it, the clients in it, are going to be happy uh, in the main in a, a national business? Um, and, and that is completely different, whatever anybody tells you, it's different than just being your business in your office or your couple of offices or whatever you've got. Um, so it is, I kind of joke with people, but it's not really a joke when I when I say, you have to be conscious you are selling your soul to the devil when, you're, when you come to wow. me. It's, just, selling it's just that I'm a nicer devil than the others. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're not but a you're theatrical the... devil, are you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's uh, but there is a level of, it's not that I'm trying to be devilish and I'm going to ruin your world. It's just the fact it, that change is dramatic. It, and if you're just being chased by the pound signs of it, you will bluff your I have seen it so many times I've seen people have sat on the other side of the table maybe not with a mic in front of me but a table like this and I can see it in the face that they just want this deal to happen because they, they the money is driving it mm. and they they bluff their way into thinking that they could work in that environment and you mentioned the word about advisors you know particularly people who own their own businesses they're entrepreneurs nothing will kill an entrepreneur like a like a national business. Mm. <laughs> and it's, you know, it's a good point. I, the reason I, I raise this is because every time I see a, a business which is acquired, there's always a statement about, we chose this firm because of the cultural fit. Mm. And I always think, how genuine is that statement? Because, you know, as you go, you know, you're asking about the why, aren't you? And I understand the cultural piece, but it's almost, if my IFA, sold i would say well you sell to whatever business you think is right for you because you're the one who's taken the risk you've invested your money probably remortgaged your house you've done everything and sacrificed all of those good times Mm -hmm. with your partner your children etc i have no issue in that advisor maximizing the deal for him yeah but it's almost it seems that every article I read, it's all about the client. It's almost, are we becoming subservient to the client? The client is everything. Because if a client was to sell their business, they wouldn't be thinking about their advisor. Does that make sense? It it, it, it does make sense. Um, it's, it, it's a bizarre, it's kind of caught me on the hop because the client is everything because the client is the asset. <laughs> um, but I get your point. Yeah. Um, but, but you know the buyer. But you don't know what's going to happen in the future. No, but the buyer, or, or, well, a shrewd, not not even a shrewd buyer, a sensible buyer. You know, when we're doing our due diligence and we're doing that 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 cultural piece, when we're looking at things and we're looking at the demographics of the clients, we're looking at the client type type, the service that they're being given. We are thinking: Is that client going to be happy in the service that we give, uh, or our proposition? And that's where, if you put down, we've looked at the cultural fit. And that would make some sense, yeah? Mm. 
But if you're just saying it, and I and I agree with you that I have seen it in some papers where you just go, well, that's not really that a real? cultural yeah. thing. It's yeah. just that's just. The but right, I do think there the are right lots of genuine advisors who do want the best for their clients. Absolutely. But it's almost like it's, it's almost it's the same article. Yeah. It's always about yeah. that cultural fit. I, and and on that point, I would I definitely see more advisors who are selling that really do care about their clients than I don't. And that's my point. Is most of those would are distraught if they think their clients are not getting the service that they would have given them before, and there's nothing they could they could be still in the organisation, but there's nothing they can do to try and change that, and they are distraught, they're stressed, they they hate it, and they end up being absolutely um, yeah the worst worst case scenario you know they can't hold the head up high in the golf course is the old phrase that people use once you've sold out isn't it because okay, like it's a personal relationship yeah, it's a personal and it's their most important yeah. you know money isn't the most important yeah. thing to a lot of people so, in terms of their and so that's their that's life. why you do have to be careful that you you really do t- i suppose it's the reverse due diligence have you really got under the bonnet of the person or the, the business that's buying you and understand what that client services how your advisors mm. that you've brought into the industry or trained up or or thing are they really going to be happy and if they're not happy then they're going to end up going elsewhere or trying to go elsewhere i think it shows how the industry has changed yeah. now over 20 years yeah. which i think is a positive but if i was to put you now into a time machine john looking into the future we talked about consolidation in the next five years what do you think the advisor landscape looks like Okay, um, all right. So put this, put this podcast into a time capsule. See, see where I was right or where I was wrong. Um, I think, I think the consolidation market will continue to consolidate in that it will continue to consolidate with itself. So there will be a a, a good ten or so large national IF, uh, well, whether they're IFA or advisor firms, uh, uh, and and. I think they will, you know, so at the moment you've only really got what St. James's Place, True Potential, mm. uh, Evelyn Partners maybe, uh, of, 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 of a real scale of, of advisor-led uh, scale. And you've got all the big wealth managers, but they tend to be investment managers first and then have smaller um, IFA bits. So I think they'll become another six or seven really household or, or you know, as, as much as our uh, sector has household names to, to become sector sector names uh, and those that want to sell out in that time will continue to sell out i think the really interesting space is um the the space of the the new type of advisor that will come out um and this everything comes around in cycles the, the longer you're around the more you realize mm-hmm. you know Markets go up and down over cycles. New ideas are the old ideas of seven or eight years ago with a different name tag on them or whatever else. And I think it's just that time that um, the, the, there is still a need for individuality within the financial planning uh, advice that's given to clients. You can you can nationalise it to some extent and that will deal with a core type of client and core, core type of client need. But there is still... A need and a drive for new types of uh, way of giving the advice and the relationship you have with the clients, and the more businesses that get swallowed into the type of business that that I run, mm-hmm. then that that leaves a gap for for those kind of clients and and the advisors that and planners that like to give that type of advice. And I think that is a growing market. I think it's really difficult to know how it's going to happen. Those that are really brave will go for it in an entrepreneurial spirit, and you can see people. You know, you read the press every week at the moment, and there's a couple of guys setting up together, like-minded spirits, and it's you just look again, at it yeah. and you go, "Fantastic!" You know, go for it, lads. And I, I wish you all the best, and and if I can help in any way, just from a kind of a being there as a as an industry, um, you know, somebody who's been around the block or whatever, and and help, then then great. You know, just give us a shout. You know, no, no charge. Um, but they are they need to be different so they can't go and get private equity because that's going to give them the wrong kind of model um so there needs to be new ways of 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 of, of homing those and it's you know it's interesting so the yeah they you know the 
accountancy practices will used to be a fantastic way of getting into financial planning and owning your clients and, and running that bit. And of course, they you see them coming back because there's one or two that are still around who are this doing very well. They're doing very well, and they've been in it a long time. And I know who you're talking about, <laughs> but um, yeah, um, but yeah, I, I, I'd, I'd love them to. Um, they, they, they got frightened off by the regulatory part of it, no doubt. Uh, particularly as a, as a limited partnership type, or a limited partnership should should help them to do that. I, I, I remain convinced that that is the, the a great place to have your advice and, and to be given advice and to, to be a financial planner. You know, as I said before, I think it's a, a great way to do it. Um, but I do think uh, that there needs to be more smaller IFA firms with like-minded people coming together in a financial community and, and being given that opportunity to, to grow, not looking to sell, uh, looking for a long-term uh, business and you know that you can see it funny enough again you always will look at the states you can see it in the states at the moment you can see the, the kind of new you know we, we've had next gen type type things which isn't that but it's something different I mean, you can see in the states something called breakaway advice and things like that and I, I think that's a really interesting space to watch well I, I think it gives consumer choice as well yeah, which is the great. Yeah, thing. yeah, yeah. Which might seem a really weird thing. Why am I talking about that? Because because I, I do put myself as a as a planner first, and 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 part of the the, the profession from that viewpoint. Want the profession to have all its bits. I know I know that's not what I'm running day to day at, at this minute in time. And what what I'm running, I'll make the best that, that I can and be that model for the for the uh, the, the the general advisor. But I, uh, for the general advisor and the general client. But I do think that there's some clients who, who want something different that we can't really provide that these type of businesses, if they're brave enough, could. And I think that's a really exciting space. Yeah, and I, More exciting than it. tech or artificial intelligence or all the things that How are all you, really, John. I know, <laughs> I know which are all really important and will drive maybe some of these things. But they're always the things that we always talk about. And it's not that. It's actually the proposition behind uh, some of these people getting together, these advisors, these planners getting together and going, right, okay, how do we actually disturb the market and make it something different that actually a client can get behind and really feel part of, really feel the value of what they're given? And don't just play with it. You know, don't have a little bit of a fixed fee and then still have a, 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 a valor, ad valorum fee behind it where you pretend to do the investment advice when you're not doing the investment advice because somebody else is doing it mm. just to justify your fees. Go for it. Go for it. If you want to go for it, go for it and have the planning and do it as a fee. Um, and, and be brave and, and really stand out as a client from that viewpoint. Uh, sorry, as an advisor from that point. Good advice. Well, let's see what happens. Let's see we? what happens. Yeah, yeah. We're, gonna, we're gonna time this <laughs> in a few years. Um, so I'm conscious that we've we've come to the top of the hour anyway on this podcast. And it's been great to talk to you, John. The, the, the question I'm gonna ask you, so final question. Yeah. Um, and you don't know this. This is the old recruitment question that I've oh, asked many, many, many times before. It's going so, to have to be a seven-figure number. <laughs> Sorry, oh, you didn't want me to Oh, okay. Stop talking about the things anyway. <laughs> uh, so, so what question would you, have you like to have been asked today but haven't? Um, um, the, the one that you had as the final question in the... <laughs> not because, this unscripted podcast. But, right, yes. Yeah. So I did confess yeah. that you did, you did yes, send you did. me some, yeah. some things. And, and only because I think the question was, um, what advice would you give to yourself yes. at the start, yeah. Uh, yeah, at the start of your career, wasn't it? I think you can take that like one. That. You can take that one. And the only reason I'm taking it is <laughs> it's because I looked at this question and I went, oh, I don't know. I was never great at taking advice <laughs> when I was young anyway. So... And then I realized I've been married for 35 years, so I've got out of giving myself advice. So I've got somebody else who gives me the advice. <laughs> so, so I asked Karen, I said, how should I answer this question? And she said, patience. You need to have more patience. Be patient. Always be patient. Always take your time. Never make rush decisions. Wow. And she said it within a nano of a second. Wow. <laughs> so, so I thought... Was that a shock to you? <laughs> it was, rather. Yeah. yeah um, I, but, but I thought, oh, yeah, she's right. And I've been thinking about it, uh, you know, on the car journey up here this morning and things like that. So, um, so yeah, I thought, I thought you know, uh, that was so. That More was patience then. Yeah. So, and I know what she was getting at. It, it's, um, I was always in a hurry 
you know, going back to your point, you know, did I spend enough time with the family and things like that? Mm-hmm. The other, the other kind of self kind of <laughs> flatulation thing probably is I was always too much in a hurry to get to the next bit, that's next stage. What am I doing next? What, what or what's the next stage of the of the career? You know, I've made partner. What, what? Okay, I've made partner. What do I do now? Um, you know, all, all of those kind of things. Can you, can you see yourself retiring ever? Oh God! I was gonna say, what what would you do? See, I don't think Karen will ever listen to this, but I think I've been saying. That. I'll send it to her. <laughs> um, I, I, retiring, yes, as in not working a five day a week or six day, whatever you know, uh, full time uh, role. Never not doing stuff uh, in the, in the profession or, or playing a part. No, I can't. And I, and interesting, it, it wasn't really. And, and inspiring you asked me a question who's inspired me it's a slightly different point but um there were there have always been people in in my career in my times who've inspired and helped people of my generation and i suppose i'm realizing it's kind of my time to and my and the people around me to to give back so People like um, no longer with us, uh, and I didn't know him very well. Unfortunately, I, w- I wish I had known him a lot better. But people like Paul Bradshaw, who who helped on help Dave Fergus on on Nucleus and various other things, there's Peter Mann. And there's there's a whole kind of mm. realm of about you know, and I, I, I feel guilty that I'm not. I should kind of reel off about six or seven different names. But they they were people who, whether people knew it or not, um, somebody who who was chair. Um, at Sandlam, uh, Angus Samuels, people, people like that. that that's a PY. Um, they, Punta Southall, sorry. They um, really spent time with people who had ideas and wanted to do something different. You know, not only did they spend time, they actually invested in their both time and, and money sometimes to, to 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 help people out like that. And I think we need at, at my my generation if for a different bit of my stages we need to be kind of doing that back to to this generation um and saying right okay what do you need what you know what support do you need how can we help um and i think and so answering your question i could get really excited about that in the future of of, of trying to do that, that kind of thing great time so yeah no karen no unfortunately i won't be at home every day every day and she'd probably be secretly very happy about that covid was great for that wasn't it for everybody yeah. Uh, six months at home and you go, yeah, tap you get back yeah. at work, John. I, I learned quite quickly <laughs> not to be at home. All right. I think that's a really good way to end the uh, podcast, John. It's been a, a delight and a pleasure to talk to you today. Thank you. Uh, so Thanks thank for you the therapy. Much. That's all right. It's free of charge. <laughs> John White, thank you very much. Cheers.